public, were we really? A little more so than. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Minneapolis City Planning Commission meeting of June 9, 2014. My name is Ted Tucker. I'm president of the Planning Commission. Joining me today are Commissioners Forney, Slack, Gesselman, Lipke Peer, and Brown. And I think a few others will be showing up soon. Our first order of business is uh, to approve the actions from the meeting of May 19th, 2014. May I have a motion to approve those actions? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed? Okay, those are approved. Our next item is to approve the agenda for today. Uh, we will go through the agenda that you see on these blue sheets out on the table outside and decide which items will be put on the consent agenda that is uh, approved uh, as recommended by staff with any conditions uh, without further discussion or if they would be continued to a future meeting uh, or put on the discussion agenda. So item number one is an alley vacation at 300 2nd Street South and 333 1st Street South. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendation on item number one? We'll put that on consent. Item number two is Webster Elementary uh, conversion to a K-5 through 3K prototype at 425 5th Street Northeast. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendation on item number two. If not, that goes on consent as well. Item number three is Elmwood Properties, 837 15th Avenue Southeast. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendation on item number three? If not, that's on consent as well. Uh, let's see, item number four uh, Severson Porch Expansion, 3900 4th Avenue South. Uh, anyone wishing to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendation for item number four? If not, also placed on consent. Item number five, Colonel West, 312 Lake Street West will be continued to the meeting of uh, June 23rd, 2014. Item number six, Blaisdell Apartments, uh, 2118 Blaisdell Avenue, uh, will also be continued to the meeting of, is that the 23rd? June 23rd, 2014. Item number seven, Mount Olivet Lutheran Church, uh, 5025 Knox Avenue South. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendation for item number seven? not we will put that on consent as well and item number eight is friendship store 317 38th street east 3800 clinton avenue south and 3805 third avenue south we will be discussing that so uh, the agenda is items for the consent agenda uh, to be adopted as recommended by staff without further discussion Items one, two, three, four, and seven. Uh, items number five and six to be continued to the meeting of June 23rd, and item number eight to be discussed. We have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Okay, that is our agenda. We move now to the report from the Committee of the Whole, Commissioner Brown. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. At the May 22nd Committee of the Whole meeting, we considered land sales at 5227 Girard Avenue North, 1977 West River Road, and downtown East uh, Block 1. And uh, at that meeting, we uh, voted, to, uh, vo voted that all of those land sales were consistent with the comprehensive plan. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a motion to find those. Uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed? Okay, we find those uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan. We move now to the public hearings. 
Uh, first item, um, I have a motion to continue to the meeting of June 23rd, items 5 and 6. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Okay, those items will be continued. I'll now open the public hearing for the items on the consent agenda, items 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7. Uh, let me ask again if there's anyone here wishing to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendation for those five items. If not, I will close the public hearing. May I have a motion to uh, adopt the staff recommendations? Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Okay, uh, those are adopted. Um, so uh, if those were your items, please uh, talk to the staff uh, to find out about further actions there. So we move to our one item for discussion, item eight, the Friendship Store. And uh, we have a staff report from uh, Becca Farrar, please. Uh, remembering that we've seen this twice in Cal, so we're quite familiar. Although it's a very complicated report with, I think, 12 alternative co compliance requests and 15 conditions as well as the 13 items. So walk us through it. Good afternoon. I shall do my best. Um, the applications that are before you, of course, are the property first located at 317. Our map Street is not East. focused. Is that something you can do? Usually they do Or up the booth has to do that. There we go. Okay. Thank you. All right. So again, the properties that we're looking at um, that are before you include 317, 38th Street East, 3800 and 3808 Clinton Avenue South, and 3805, 3815, 3817, 3821, and 3825 Third Avenue South. So there are eight parcels in total that comprise a development site. Uh, the applicant, of course, is Seward Co-op, and they're proposing to construct a new two-story or 30 foot, 35 foot tall, approximately 21,295 square foot grocery store. Um, so the subject parcels are obviously those that are highlighted up on your screen. Um, I'm going to show you in just a minute um, a site plan. I've, I've Hopefully I've sort of simplified all the applications and I'll run through those in just a second. But of course, this is the context. It's located across from Sabathany Community Center, um, across Third Avenue. There's some new townhomes that are constructed here. There's sort of a small commercial building that's zone C1 in this location, single family home, kitty corner across the intersection. Um, across 38th. Um, on the subject development parcel, of course, there is the building that was formerly occupied by the church. There's some vacant parcels that front along 38th Street. Uh, there's also a single family home that's located along Clinton that would be demolished as part of this application. And then as you go down the block, 3815 is currently vacant, which is part of the larger church parcel. 3817 is a single family home. 3821 is an existing duplex. And then the last parcel is a single family home. So all of these structures would be demolished uh, for this proposed development. I thought it might be easier for me to run uh, through the applications like this. Um, looks like that is in view. Of course, this is a site plan that is in your packet, so I'm going to run through this one because this is, of course, the site plan that um, we analyzed as part of the application. Um, they have made some modifications, which I'll go through a little bit later, but first let's just talk about the applications um, as they were when they came into the city. First, of course, is the rezoning application. All of the parcels that um, compose the development site are all zoned R1A at this point in time. 38th Street East, as I mentioned in the background of the staff report, is a designated community corridor in this location. And this site is approximately about a block from the neighborhood commercial node that's located at 38th and 4th. Um, so again, all these parcels are zoned R1A. They're currently proposing to um, rezone five of those parcels from R1A to C1 to accommodate basically that front portion of the block that would be located adjacent to 38th Street East. So in the small area plan for this area, all of these parcels are designated for mixed-use development. 
Um, the parcels that are located basically below this line would maintain the R1A zoning. That's three standard residential lots, and they're proposing to rezone it to add that transitional parking overlay district so the parking can be associated with a larger C1 zone parcel. So again, R1A to C1, adding the transitional parcel or transitional parking overlay district to these three R1A zone parcels. Of course, anytime you do a parking lot in the transitional parking overlay district, you're required to do a CUP. And then as I've highlighted here, they're requesting a variance along third from 20 feet to seven feet for this parking lot. They are requesting on the other side of the site along Clinton. This is also a front yard. For the first 25 feet, they're required to have a setback of 17 feet. They're proposing to go to zero feet. Um, it's important to note that they are meeting their interior side yard requirement in that location of seven feet. Um, there is a rear yard setback that applies here just abutting the parking lot. They are proposing to vary that requirement from five feet to two feet, three inches. This is the only application that we are proposing um, be denied this evening is this application here um, adjacent to that rear yard. In addition, they need variances of the transitional parking overlay district standards for this specific site. As you know, parking lots are um, limited to a width of 75 feet. In this specific circumstance, they're approximately 136 feet. And they're also proposing to uh, vary that gate requirement that we have for the transitional parking overlay district. It basically says between the hour after hours of 10 and 6 um, that the parking lot be gated off. And so they are varying that standard. They're also varying the standard um, that's allowed for a commercial size in the C1 district from 4,000 square feet to 21,295 square feet. There's an impervious surface variance request on this south parking lot. Um, what is allowed is 65% in the R1A district. They're proposing to go to 79.3. They're varying roof sign standards regarding height, location, and type. Uh, there's also site plan review, of course, a preliminary and final plat. Of course, there's many um, underlying uh, uh, platted lots and they're proposing to basically go to two lots and a small outlot as well as dedicating a new alley that extends out to third um, and then lastly the current configuration of the alley on this specific site is that it terminates to 38th Street it's a straight alley through the block um, what they would be doing is dead ending the alley which is something typically Public Works has not been supportive of um, but they have worked with Public Works to accommodate a turnaround that um, trash and uh, plow trucks will be able to maneuver in and they will extend a new uh, extension out to Third Avenue South so the alley will basically uh, more or less end up in sort of a T shape as it extends down to the next block um, again, this is the only variance that we are um, recommending, the only application this evening that we are recommending be denied from, denied from five feet to two feet, three inches. Um, in the background of the staff report, um, I do talk about the reason why um, we are recommending denial on that yard, and it has a lot to do with the fact that, of course, there's the impervious surface requirement, the fact that there's a seven-foot uh, landscape yard requirement in the Chapter 530 standards um, and the fact that much of the parking lot doesn't meet the interior landscaping standards because the islands are not landscaped. Um, one uh, thing that should be noted, however, is that um, the, the reason that the, the landscape islands are not landscaped within the parking lot is that the maneuvering that they propose to do on site is going to be rolling over the those areas. So when they do have large trucks that come into the site, um, they'll be utilizing a lot of the parking lot. Uh, for their maneuvering so they're not doing it in the public street. So based on the all of uh, the different findings in the staff report, um, this is basically with the conditions of approval that staff put on the project, this is in essence what we were recommending should be the outcome. Um, so in addition to denying that rear yard variance, you'll notice in the background of the staff report um, that we attach several conditions of approval to this project. There are several that are standard, but in total, there are 15 conditions of approval. Um, and some of those would have basically resulted in the configuration of the parking lot looking like this. So I want to run through this, and hopefully this will make sense, um, even though I've, I've drawn it in. Of course, this isn't to scale. But in essence, what we were recommending as part of this, because as Ted noted, or President Tucker, um, in essence, they were requiring or requesting that they get alternative compliance for 12 items in addition to seven variances. And so an effort to make this parking lot a bit more visually appealing, denying this yard requirement um, was one standard. And then we also recommended that it meet the seven foot landscape yard requirement. And so as we were doing sort of the tabulations about how that would work out, it appeared that if 
basically there was no adjustment made on the Third Avenue south side. The drive aisles that are currently shown were at 21 feet. 20 feet is the minimum for a one-way drive aisle, so that picks up two feet. Kicking this out seven feet, basically adjusting all of these areas, including a four-foot walkway, which is one of the conditions of approval. Um, because as, as I also mentioned in the site plan review standards, we were a little concerned about just the, the traffic flow and how it was going to be operating. Um, ideally, 38th Street East would not have that curb cut in that location, but it's necessary for their truck um, loading. It would be obviously a safer condition for pedestrians. So this was our solution to include a walkway put in four parallel spots and then to stripe it out um, so that there was a walkway from the south end of the parking lot across the drive aisles and the driveways. Um, so basically it would have resulted in a loss of six to seven parking spaces with this staff recommended configuration. So again, this is the outcome of what all of the conditions of approval would have resulted in. Um, So before I go um, into how they have responded to the comments, I do want to just, and I think this is probably for the purposes of time and, and also to allow other testimony, I want to just run through the site plan review conditions of approval um, just so that um, is uh, uh, something that you're thinking about as, as um, I go through the revised proposal. But some of the different things um, that are not standard that typically you see on a site plan review, we'll start with condition. Um, number five, and basically this is something that we've required on buildings where we have larger tenant spaces and allowed, whether it's in the C3A district or that we have larger commercial buildings such as this. Again, this building that's proposed is five times larger than, would be, than what would typically be allowed in the C1 district under these standards. Um, and so the recommendation was that the building should have a minimum of 50% transparent windows given the size of the commercial space um, on the north elevation of the building facing 38th Street East. And, that, and the building elevation currently as it sits, as, it, as it's proposed, does meet that requirement. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, moving on to condition six, I talk about it being a requirement to have 40% transparent windows on the west elevation of the building. And of course, this is f facing the large surface parking lot. There's a bus, bus uh, stop across the street at Sabathony, and there's also one across uh, 3rd Avenue. So we felt that it was important to have a lot of glass and fenestration facing that elevation. Uh, currently, um, as the building is designed, in the packet, it does not meet that standard, so they would need to increase their window percentage on that elevation. Um, there are a couple others, no plain face concrete block, which we know is not a permitted material, and they have no issue with, with that aspect. Um, another component of the building that we requested some changes, and this goes to um, the first floor plan that was submitted for the project, and so actually I'm going to zoom out just a touch so that you can see both of the components that we were concerned about. So as you know, and um, as it was proposed um, at the Committee of the Whole, and again, I'm taking this project over from Kimberly Holine, who did all of the initial legwork on this. I meant to give her credit in the beginning. Um, but on the parking lot side, that they obviously have an entrance in and out, um, and that's how it was shown at Committee of the Whole. But this elevation or this component or the interior programming of the building in this location has changed since you last saw it. And what we express in the background of the staff report is how concerned we are about that, not having an active corner and how there needs to be transparency. Um, what's shown in this area is an elevator storage room. Um, the last time that you had seen it, it was an entrance to the building. Um, so there had been some adjustments here since the last Committee of the Whole meeting. In addition, um, at that Committee of the Whole meeting, you had talked about them incorporating a, a uh, entrance off of 38th Street that was more mid-building and not so um, close to the surface parking lot into that common vestibule that I was just talking about. So they have put an entrance in that location, um, but staff's concern in this specific situation is that the doors don't face the street. Uh, they face interior, um, and there has not, at least in my recent recollection, been a building that we've approved where we've allowed the doors to face the interior. Um, the applicant has basically said that the reason the, the doors have been positioned uh, in that way or in in that manner is because of energy efficiency and trying to gain some some uh, credits that way so in essence what that did was that change the elevations from the ones that you saw last at Committee of the Whole so these are the ones that are again in your packet it put basically an inactive corner on the building with a fiber cement board panel in this location um, again this is the entrance that would be facing the parking lot um, and then the 38th Street entrance um, while there is a canopy that highlights the entrance, and I think that's important, it's not as though there's nothing there to delineate that there's a principal entrance. Again, uh, there are no doors that actually face the street. So I just wanted to point that part out for you. 
Um, so that leads to condition number nine, where we talk about the principal entrance on the north elevation of the building facing 38 shall be reoriented so the doors face the street. Um, number 10, again, this is just uh, basically going over what I just said, but we um, basically put in this condition of approval that the elevator storage room that's located at the corner of the building shall be relocated and transparent windows shall be incorporated to provide transparency. Um, we did further encourage them uh, to consider incorporating a secondary entrance into a common vestibule um, off of 38th in order to activate that corner of the building. Um, no concerns regarding the blank wall provision, but moving on to 12, uh, this is the stipulation that I just talked about in that southern parking lot of including a well-lit uh, four-foot wide walkway, bisecting the center, and, um, center island, excuse me, of parking at the south end of the parking lot, um, and then including uh, some markings in the pave, uh, within the drive aisles to delineate pedestrian crossing. Um, 13, again, refers to that seven-foot landscaped yard requirement um, that I've talked about a couple of times um, along that property line. So in response to this, um, to these conditions of approval, and again, it was because of the 12 items they were asking alternative compliance for and the seven variances, um, ultimately what they have come back with, and they may want to speak to this a little bit more, but I think they have tried to strike a bit of a compromise um, with us without having to lose parking. Um, they said that the 70 spaces that are provided are critical and so they basically work to try and figure out a way uh, to maintain the parking spaces that they have originally proposed in terms of a numerical amount. So when you look at this, basically what they're proposing in that south end of the parking lot is that it would comply with a five foot yard and it would require, and it would also comply with the seven foot landscaping and screening requirement along that yard. So this is a completely new addition. There was no landscaping, there was no landscaped yard, um, and it was not meeting the setback requirement. So they're not, um, they're not contesting the denial recommendation on that yard anymore. Um, in terms of the other components, um, they have, this is basically the corner of the building, so this is 38th, and this is facing out toward the parking lot, and where the elevator control room took up a very large component of this corner of the building, it now takes up about seven feet by five feet. So there's 35 square feet here that are blocked out at the corner. They would be proposing to put a new window in in this location. So it is an improvement. I think from a staff perspective, the only thing that um, is a consideration is, you, you know, what would be here? Um, you know, how, even though there is glass, is it actually active? You know, with how that space interfaces with the outside. Um, as you flip, this is basically what that elevation would look like. So this is approximately a dimension of seven feet, and this is facing the parking lot. And this would be the new storefront panel that would be included. So all in all, if you follow that very lengthy um, description, the only applications, uh, the only conditions of approval that are being contested by the applicant at this point would be 9, 10, and 12. Uh, again, they don't want to uh, flip the doors to face the street on 38th, so that's number 9. Uh, 10, uh, they're not looking to fully re relocate that elevator storage room. Instead, it would be smaller, and they're not proposing to put a secondary entrance off of 38th as further recommended by staff. And then lastly, 12, um, they are not proposing at all to put the walkway in and they would not need to realign the parking um, to the parallel spaces in that location as I had previously shown you. So that is it in summation. I can answer other questions um, about the development, but again, other than that rear yard variance in the south parking lot, we're recommending approval on all applications. Um, and I will close there for questions. Okay, let's see if there are questions of staff at this point. I don't see anything. I guess we understand it perfectly. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Kimberly for, for the groundwork on all this. Oh, yeah. do you have a, one of your site plans that we can keep up on the screen for reference? I liked your, well, both were very helpful diagrams explaining what do you What's want, going on? this is the one that's in your packet. Is that helpful or would you prefer to have? I, I like the one where you highlighted your proposal okay. with uh, parallel parking slots. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the applicant can, will, will have other diagrams that show their proposed resolution of these issues. Okay, uh, so with no questions of staff, we will uh, move to the uh, public hearing. Let me just note that we've been joined by Commissioner Bender. 
So first in the uh, public hearing, I would like to hear from the applicant, and obviously we've chatted with you a couple of times and be very interested in your concerns about the uh, conditions and anything else you want to talk about, but you don't have to describe the entire project. Great. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, I'm Sean Doyle. I'm the general manager of the Seward Co-op. Uh, Bruce Cornwall is here with us as well as some other members of our team, Lydia, Mike, and Eric. Um, first of all, thanks, Becca, for uh, all the work that staff, you and other staff members have done to work through this project. It's a very complicated project, as you are probably uh, observing. Um, also want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, Elizabeth Glidden, our council member from Ward 9, and her staff for support in other areas around the community engagement process that we've had. And uh, finally, thank you, commissioners, for uh, meeting with us a mul multiple times to try to get this uh, project uh, to a place where it's a, it's a solid proposal. So I wanted to acknowledge and thank you for that. I think the results are a very good proposal. Um, as the general manager of Seward Co-op, I'm very excited to be standing here before you uh, with this proposal to have a grocery store built at 38th, and, uh, 38th Street and Bryant neighborhood. As you can gather from the staff report, there is significant support in the community for this uh, project, as well as some detractors. We've had many conversations in the community. Uh, after all, we are owned by the community. Uh, we have uh, nearly 12,000 households who own our co-op. Um, and of that, about 1,500 live within a mile and a half of this site. So we're very excited about uh, bringing a co-op grocery store closer to the homes of a significant portion of our, our current owners. Um, we also think that we'll be serving the larger mission of the co-op of sustaining uh, a healthy community by providing better access to fresh, healthy food in South Minneapolis. Uh, I know the purpose of this meeting is to review the site plan, and I've got Bruce here to talk about the details of the site but I just wanted to introduce myself and express gratitude for the consideration. Thank you very much. Bruce. President Tucker and commissioners, my name is Bruce Cornwall, as um, Sean said, with LHB Architects. Um, Becca did a great job of going through that very quickly and succinctly. Um, I would just like to kind of uh, elaborate just a little bit short on those three items. Um, first was number nine which is the, um, the principal uh, elevation along 38th and the, the suggestion to reorient the entrance. Um, uh, as, as we go through design, and you folks see this all the time, as we try to work within the programmatic requirements, our, our north-south dimension from the south part of the building to the 38th Street is extremely tight for getting a grocery store to work. So when we were suggested by the Committee on the Whole to actually move an entrance to 38th, at first we said, how can we do that? Then we figured out a way to do it, but it required us to actually have the uh, vestibule oriented the way you see it on the submittal. To actually have it vertical as you come in with the seven foot depth that's required for ADA accessibility basically bisects that portion of the, of the uh, store where we're trying to get in front of the cash registers, the place where you eat and the, and the community room or the classroom. So to actually rotate that 90 degrees would, would really be very complicated in terms of the store design, how it actually functions for the, for the owners. So um, we thought we were doing a great job here of, of animating the facade um, at the, I think, I think the indent, the cutout would be actually quite prominent, and I think it'll read quite strongly as, uh, as an entrance as you walk along the street. Um, so I don't think there'll be any real confusion with that. Okay, before so, we go on, uh, Commissioner Lipke here, you had a question on the entrance? I, I did actually. Can you, do you have a, a floor plan that shows the layout? So you do talk about the registers and the orientation, and, and, and our floor plans are, are bare, so I don't know where your registers and everything are. Yeah, okay, if we can. Becca, can I use your? Or do you, your plan of the store? The one that shows that. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, this, we weren't required to actually submit the layout of the store, so we didn't do that. So basically, I'll draw on this. This is where the checkout is. And as you enter here, you're greeted essentially by an information. 
and then a, a kind of a quite standard way of shopping, you immediately come into produce and then you move through the store in a very almost programmed way, choreographed way that I think if you look at all your grocery stores, you'll see are kind of laid out in that way. So the movement through the store is like that. And then you come around here. Up here, if we were to orient our door here, and remember we can't have a door swing across the public right away, we'd still have to have the recess. And seven feet, we'd have to do something like that. And you can see it really starts cutting this off. This needs to be on this side of the cash registers. We also wanted to make sure when we saw some, when someone came in that door, we would see them uh, just from a standard security standpoint. Um, and that would also um, provide a nice area for the seating, which of course is on the street, and of course the classroom, which is on the street, and we think the actual cash register in that activity, I think, is on the street and very interesting to see. So um, we worked pretty hard, very hard actually, to kind of move it from this location to that location and still, um, we think, compliance spirit with the idea of keeping the street animated, which we philosophically agree totally. So that, that's really number nine. Are there any other questions about that? I don't see any. Yeah, proceed. Yeah. So then on number 10, um, which we can keep that drawing up as well, um, the elevator storage room, um, basically it's the controls room, and we've reduced it to the corner. And if you look at the elevation, we have a rhythm, it's in your packet, the rhythm of the piers and the glass. So it's a very natural place to tuck a solid portion of the building because we have a very traditional, I think, kind of commercial retail look of that. So I don't think we're, we couldn't really open that up to glass uh, and keep that nice rhythm going, which again is a very typical commercial pattern. The um, adding an entrance there uh, is another challenge primarily because, again, I'll start with programmatically, grocery stores would love to have only one entrance actually in terms of how they control, so the two, is uh, um, already kind of a, a, a stretch in terms of making the store work commercially and programmatically and urbanistically. The, um, the other thing there is that corner, and again, this was suggested originally when we were at the Committee of the Whole. Um, if you remember, the site here is kind of cockeyed. So where the location is on 38th is a place where we can actually meet the grade, the natural slope to have an entrance. But to continue the natural slope, the corner where we have the elevator now is actually not on the floor grade. So we would actually have to adjust and have some steps there, maybe more ramping to make that work because we're kind of tucked into the hill a bit, as you will. And it's, it's a difficult thing to kind of visualize, but it wouldn't be just as easy to plop in a door there. We'd actually have to modify the grade and have some exterior steps. Right now when you're on 38th and you walk towards the entrance, you walk slightly downhill to get to the entrance. So what I'm saying is when you stand here, you walk downhill to get in here. Now when I say downhill, it's all under, you know, it's all accessible route, but it's still a slope. So when you're here, you're actually above grade. So just in terms of the complexity of all of that, it didn't seem to make sense to us. I actually really like the idea of adding this glass. I think it's actually improved things. On this wall of the, yeah that Becca showed. Um, let's see how oriented, so it's always the same, like that. Um, this view now, um, as you come in, you'll actually have a very nice, I actually I think this is really a good improvement, you'll have a great view into the store. And this, remember, or maybe you don't remember, but part of our responsibility is we're trying to use different areas to tie in the history of the Sabathity Center and that old church that was there, as opposed to the, the, the structure itself doesn't have any real value, but the social history does. So we were going to originally use this as a, as a mural to reflect that history. And now we're suggesting that we actually will do something kind of set back in that area to still to put the mural, but it'll just be behind glass. So I think with that and the aspect of um, that type of, uh, of movement, we believe that this is where the ATM is going. We do think there'll be people there. I do think you'll see into the store. You'll see lights and you will see activity. And of course, you will see the movement of the stair up and down, which I think is neat. 
not unlike we've uh, uh, has happened at Whole Foods um, downtown and um, in Lunds downtown. They both have stairs going on, um, exposed as part of the um, facades. Um, then lastly, um, on the parking, which is maybe this is that, okay. How does that raise up? How do we raise this up? Can you looking for Zoom? I don't see Zoom. It's just like there's a yeah, got it. Okay. Oop, wrong way. Can you see this now? So this is um, as the uh, as we put in the application. It's a little distorted. Um, and so, uh, you know, Becca and staff pointed out some uh, of the shortcoming, particularly along this. So we went back to the drawing board, um, or they suggested, I should say, they went back to the drawing board and suggested this layout. And this is the one with you can actually see in in you know, kind of hardline CAD form that version with the four parallel parking, the um, aisle, and pulling this back. Um, in this case, uh, 10 8 to get that landscaped area. Um, you know, officially, this does work. You can get cars around there. Remember, we're actually doing one way. Our concerns are one, as you've heard, we've reduced parking. We have um, a minimum required of 31, I think a maximum of 86, and we're proposing 70. And those of you who are, have worked in grocery stores, we would love to have a 10 to 1 ratio. We'd like to have a 100 or something to actually make the typical ratio. So we don't feel that we're pushing any limits. And we, of course, aren't achieving our maximum site. So we are trying to maximize the number of parking spaces we can, including in our community meetings. Some of the talk was, please keep your shoppers off our streets. So we're also trying to maximize that as much, answering those questions from the neighbors. But from a practical standpoint, we're always hesitant to have parallel parking behind um, 90 degree, just in terms of the people pulling out and the potential for the, the dings that happen along here and the dented doors. We also have a bit of a problem with the one way and people having to go past and then back in. So as people are following each other around, there's always that potential of people having to back up and just the frankly, the quality of parallel parkers and what that means in terms of how much of this is blocked or not. And remember, we can't curb this because of the truck movement makes it kind of problematic to make this like a raised pedestrian area. So we believe that this actually won't be very efficient, actually will cause some significant and potential backups. So what we've proposed, um, and Becca showed this, um, but this is a hard line where we actually get this down so we don't require that variance along that side. We cover all of our other requirements. We still keep the one way. We still keep our 70 uh, parking spaces. And um, we just make some minor adjustments to the width of the drive aisle, all still within zoning and code requirements. Um, and we think it's a real good compromise, uh, meaning we kind of eliminate the issues of being too close to our neighbors, uh, but we still are able to keep the number of parking spaces that we need. So I, I think that generally covers the major points of, of, uh, of discussion, and I certainly will answer more questions. Okay, we have a question from Commissioner Kronzer and then Lipke Peer. Uh, thank you, President Tucker. <clears throat> so at the curb cut off of 38th, yes. have you, in your design thinking, considered what happens at Kowalski's in Uptown on Hennepin? where you turn off a hennepin and you're forced immediately to turn right, basically into a one-way loop through the entire parking lot. Because I believe part of staff's concern is the pedestrian vehicle conflicts going to the front door. So if I'm a car coming in off of 38th, right. I then have to go west and then circle the parking lot as you've kind of identified it. Right. on the south end as a one-way loop. Have you, right. have you thought about that? And, and could that function to help alleviate some of this pedestrian vehicle uh, conflict at the, uh, the main entry? Um, 
You know, I don't know, Lydia, our landscape architect, may have some uh, who actually would develop the planning more um, in, in detail, uh, can answer questions maybe along those lines a little bit better than I can. Um, great thought has been taken into how this circulates, but maybe you want to elaborate. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question, Commissioner Kronzer. Um, oh, your, your name for the record, please. My name is Lydia Major. I'm landscape architect with LHB. So we have made a number of concessions to make that particular issue that you're talking about easier here than your experience at Kowalski's. Um, we, it'd be hard to make it one way when somebody enters here because the trucks actually, as they come out, have to swing around over this and there's a little bit of consideration there. But we've actually widened this drive aisle right here quite a bit. And we think that most customers after their first visit will likely come to this entrance. It'll be, they find, I think, much easier to get in and out. So this will become a secondary entrance to this parking lot. Um, we will have the landscaping, the signage, and everything that will make it much more inviting and much more useful to come in the other way. And with the wide and entrance here and here, that should function much more smoothly than we've seen in some other locations. So just to clarify, I think Kowalski's actually works pretty well. I mean, as okay. parking lot is <laughs> <Very good>. fairly <laughs> busy all the time. I was there on a bad day then. <laughs> it's, well, it's a one-way thing, and everyone has to go one way. So, but I, what it does, though, it takes people coming off of 3 8th away from driving right in front of the front door. Right. So that's, that's my thought process there. Mm -hmm. So uh, second question, is there a traffic seal at 38th and 3rd? Yes. There is. Okay, so that's a controlled intersection. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lipke Pierre. Yeah, actually, I have a since you're up there. Um, so my question was, uh, with the, the new proposal in that uh, adjacent to the alley, it's my recollection that the alley's lower than the lot, right? Sure. How, how many feet lower in elevation is that? So it varies um, from about four feet at this end, um, I think to five or six feet down here. Okay, and um, what kind of, I assume there's a fence going uh, on the top of this wall. Absolutely, we'll have an ornamental metal fence at the top. It'll be a residential, looking but heavy duty mm -hmm. um, retaining wall. And then with our new landscape space, we would anticipate doing some nice shrubbery and other things to um, mask the parking lot a bit more and have some plants that might actually come down over the top of that wall and soften it further. Okay, yeah, my, my question was about the landscaping actually because I don't, you know, it wasn't a landscaping plan in front of us, but I just was kind of concerned about headlights and screening, that way the neighbors who, whose backyards are along there aren't, aren't constantly seeing headlights every time they want to sit in their backyard and enjoy a nice evening. Absolutely, yeah. This would allow us to do a great deal more screening and we could go for some more evergreens and other things that would be opaque year round. Okay, and how, just off the cuff, like how many, how many shrubs and trees and stuff are we, are we talking here? Just so we have a number. Um, I would anticipate a, a spacing of three to four feet on center for those shrubs and so we're talking about uh, about 30 or so is what I'm guessing. Um, Sewer does a tremendous job of landscaping their existing site and they anticipate using a similar level of finish at their new site. So I would anticipate it being um, quite nice. Thank you. Other questions of the uh, Commissioner Slack? Uh, yes, I have a question going back to the interior of the building. And um, specifically, are, by building code, are all entrances, uh, public entrances to the building, do they have to be uh, ADA accessible? Um, there's a percentage of them, and it's over half. So both what we've done here is all of our entrances are accessible right now. So if, if the, the new entrance off of 38th, if that became essentially non-accessible? Yeah, I would, I would have to, um, if uh, Sarah were here, she'd be a concur. I believe that one would not have to be accessible. I think as long as we have that percentage of the, out of, if, if there were three, two of them were accessible, I think we'd be fine. So um, go, then going back to another part of the conversation where uh, there, we had asked for previously a, an entrance closer to the corner of the building, uh, essentially the corner of the parking lot in 38th. Um, is there an opportunity for that elevator to move to the southern portion of the building? Um, and then the entrance <laughs> going there and subsequently a stair because it doesn't need to be ADA accessible. Um, the, um, in, in terms of how the store is laid out and how people come to the store and might be going upstairs, we need that to be again in front of the cash registers. 
So when someone comes in and, for example, has a business meeting, we need them to kind of just kind of check in with the desk and then go straight up. And of course, some people some people need to have the um, uh, use the elevator. So to push it to the south uh, part of the store, um, in early ideas, we were looking at that. It it never really worked very well in terms of again this kind of almost prescriptive layout of how stores work and how people move through a store about when you get produce, when you don't. And then being able to do that in the in the in in front of the cash registers, we looked at the cash registers oriented kind of north south instead of east west we'll say, um, and th that just didn't work very well. So we're we're um, as you can see because we have a loading dock down in that corner that's needed because we had to have all of our maneuvering done on on the uh, on the site. We had earlier versions where we tried to see if we could have some variances or, or leniency on having some turning or backing up on the street and that was not allowed and so then we accommodated the best we could. Other questions? I don't see any. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, at, at this point I will continue with the uh, public hearing. Uh, please when you come up uh, Say your name and address for the record, and if you haven't done so already, uh, sign the sheet outside so we have that for the record. Um, we have received many, many letters in our packets and then a big uh, electronic uh, delivery of a petition with, I think, 1,600 comments or something, very nicely organized, but we don't need to repeat all of them. A lot of them had to do with the end of a food desert in that part of town. Uh, as you can hear from the discussion so far, most of what we talk about is how the building and parking lot fit into the neighborhood, so that would be most helpful for us to hear your reactions to that. Um, with that, um, anyone who wishes to speak on this matter, please come on up and uh, give your name and address for the record and tell us uh, your opinions on this project. Commissioners. My name is Art Seratoff. I live at 4524 Columbus Avenue, which is 10 blocks from this site. Uh, I'm a neighbor. I'm also an owner. Uh, I love the idea of the co-op coming in. But what I'm here to urge you to do, and I'm working with the Central Neighborhood Organization, as well as Bryant Neighborhood Organization, my address is in Regina. What I'm urging you to do is make your approvals or follow the staff recommendations contingent on Seward and the neighborhoods agreeing to a community benefits agreement. The community benefits agreement is critical for us in a in a neighborhood that you've described as a food desert in a neighborhood that is stressed my neighbors and i see seward as an organization with incredible potential that potential can have to do with economic development it can have to do with employment. It can have to do with supporting local entrepreneurs who are urban farmers. And the neighbors want to participate. They want to be involved. And the Community Benefits Agreement would describe all of these items in some detail and would also allow transparency for the entire transaction and the history of this organization in our community so that we can see progress in hiring. We can see progress in supporting local sourcing of the immediate or to the immediate neighborhood. That we can see participation on Seward's board so that there is voice as well as participation and we can see access of neighbors who really do go hungry. I worked at Sabathony for 16 years. Those are the people that are hungry. They could use Seward. 
they could use access to Seward. And the community benefits agreement would spell that out. And so as you move forward with your process, please help us by placing a contingency based on a community benefits agreement. My understanding is that Seward and Can Do, representing the central neighborhood, is meeting in a week, and we hope that the progress on that community benefits agreement will move forward as well. Okay, I think we have a question from Commissioner Lipke Peer. Yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of get an update from your perspective then in terms of um, how, if, if this community benefits agreement has been brought to them already and how they received your idea. It hasn't been brought to Seward as a benefits agreement. Can Do did prepare a letter that outlined, it was either 12 or 13 points that would be the substance of that agreement. And my understanding is that's part of the discussion that would happen next week. Okay, so, so at this point, do you have any idea, would you say they're receptive to it or resisting, or do you not know until next week? Actually, I would ask Sean. I, I, will, I uh, will ask him then my, after we're My done perspective here. is that Seward appears open and, and did schedule the meeting, which is movement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Thank you very much. Others wishing to speak, come on up, please. Give your name and address. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Coleman. I'm in the Regina neighborhood. And, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the Bryant Central neighborhood, and I understand the years of uh, impact of this historically African-American community has had for multi-generations of, of families. I am very concerned about tonight's uh, public input meeting notice not being communicated, uh, pu not being communicated and posted uh, for seven days, seven day period on the location of the Greater Friendship Church site. I'm asking for additional time and notification for adequate uh, community input on this matter and transparency. Thank you. Any questions? I don't see any. Thank you very much. Others wishing to speak on this matter, come on up and uh, give your name and address, please. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Claire Stoshek, uh, 3420 Portland Ave South. I am uh, a community member in Central who's very interested about food access and economic opportunities for my family and for my community. I also serve on the board of the Central Area Neighborhood Organization, or Can Do. And tonight I wanted to come to support the approval of the applications that Seward is bringing to you and recognize the work that Seward has done to accommodate the needs of the community of the new store and the needs that we have expressed. Um, for example, a long-term hiring strategy, hiring quotas for people of color and women for its general contractor, et cetera. However, we all have also heard a lot of concerns from our community on this project over the many months of community meetings and events surrounding this topic, both put on by Seward and community organizations. And not all of these needs have been fully addressed yet. And I say yet, that's an important piece here. And these needs um, aren't only related to the physical design of, of this project, but also um, some other aspects. So many people who have concerns couldn't be here tonight. They're busy working. They could not come off, take off work to be here. They don't have childcare or there are language barriers. So I just want to let you know that I feel I am speaking for many other people who couldn't be here tonight. It's important that we recognize that there are concerns and discomfort in the community surrounding this project, as well as excitement. So uh, how do we actually make this work for everyone is the question I want to address tonight. And any development project this big will have large effects on a community. The steward can be and needs to be more responsive to the community's needs and accountable for the public money that they are and will be using, um, for example, from the new market tax credits, which is for uh, development in low-income communities. And this is especially true because it's in the steward's own cooperative principles to be democratic. 
So a great tool that we can use and a tool that has been used for many developing development projects across the nation is a community benefits agreement that Seward could do with the local neighborhood associations and stakeholders. And this is an exciting opportunity for the Seward to let us help you to uh, further your mission and express your, their values. So some of the issues that are most important to me and my family and topics that I've heard most resonate with the community include jobs. And I recognize that Seward has created a long-term hiring strategy around hiring more people of color. That's a super wonderful start. But it's important to take a step further so that the hiring practices create a store that has employees representative of the demographics of its new community. So policies that ensure that 70% of staff at the new store are people of color who are low income and from the community would be very important to ensure the store reflects its neighborhoods. It's also vital that the staff be at all levels of management so that people of color aren't only at entry level positions but also at all levels of, of power and management. Um, board representation ensuring that a proportional number of sewered Board seats are held by people from the new store's immediate community is very important for the proper governance of the new store. And sourcing locally and supporting a robust local food system. We want Seward to be serious about local sourcing to provide for the local food system on all levels of the food chain. We would recognize, we want to recognize that just opening the store in our neighborhood will not solve the food gap for all of our neighbors. It's just absolutely, it can't be true. Um, still many won't be able to afford the the organic food in that store. So uh, we ask that Seward invest in com community-led, culturally relevant projects that are working to take down barriers to urban agriculture and food access in our neighborhood and to support potential local producers and entrepreneurs in training and capital so they can eventually source to the Seward store so that to, to help uh, producers out from the beginning. And in conclusion, I and the Can Do Board support this project moving forward with a community benefits agreement forms between Seward, Can Do, and the Bryant Neighborhood Organization Board so that we can help ensure this development project is the best it can be for our neighbors. And Seward has kindly responded to our request for a CBA, and we look forward to working with them, with you, uh, in our meeting next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's see if there are any questions. I don't see any. Anyone else wishing to speak? Come on up. How you doing? Um, my name is Ralph Crowder, and today I'm going to speak for my uncle and my aunt, my Uncle Jim and my Aunt Luba, who stayed for years at 4205 Oakland Avenue South. Uh, my uncle was a World War II veteran, uh, very active in St. Peter's and Me Church and, and the Bryant neighborhood, along with my aunt. I would like to think that I... Um, I um, carry a certain legacy within the Bryant Central neighborhood through uh, my family. And I would like to speak specifically on the uh, Seward Project move to the Greater Friendship uh, Baptist Church. Uh, for full disclosure, I did add some assistance to the um, African American uh, public uh, relations firm that Seward Co-op hired initially to uh, communicate and frame some of the issues around Seward's move into uh, that historic black community, which is right there on the corridor of 38th and 4th Avenue. Uh, has a very extensive community uh, with a, a large amount of contributions from um, uh, generations of African Americans in that area. Um, so with that said, uh, I would like to say, start off with um, echoing the concerns about the community benefits agreement. I think that's uh, very essential moving forward with any discussion with Seward coming into uh, the Bryant Central neighborhood. I actually support the co-op being there. I think it could be a good opportunity for the neighborhood. But as it exists right now, and I'm sure as your committee knows and, and lining up with the principles of the city of Minneapolis and the many gaps that seem to perpetuate the discussions around equity, diversity, uh, any contracts or uh, RFPs that are sent out for uh, architect firms or anything like that. Um, I would like to draw some parallels with a very exact sim similar situation happening right now in Portland, Oregon, where Trader Joe's 
was moving into uh, the uh, historic black community of Portland, Oregon. And ironically enough, it was uh, led by a, a, a Gary Cunningham endorsed organization uh, from the Metropolitan uh, Council, the African American Leadership Forum of Portland, that um, had some definite issues with accountability uh, for that particular uh, business to serve its community in an equitable way, since that's a trendy word right now, I'll use that. Um, I think there should be, uh, with the community benefits agreement, uh, an affordable housing component that is included with that. Uh, there's been multi-generations of, of specifically African-American families that have continued to lose uh, stable housing in that area. That area, the neighborhood has changed drastically, as reported by the Star Tribune in the last 10 years. Um, there's been a large move or exodus out of the neighborhood to the suburbs for, let's just say, Section 8 housing and things of that nature. I think this should be an opportunity for the city of Minneapolis to um, bring some stability to the community through this initial business model that's coming in, and I'm sure it's an anchor model for some other things to come down the 38th Street corridor. Um, so it is my thought, and I'll end with this, that any of discussions around this, this topic, and the urgency that exists, especially in our inner core communities, that those conversations be done in a way that's fully transparent. I can say that um, for the last at least seven days, at the minimum, there has not been any posting done specifically on the Greater Friendship Baptist Church site, the orange stickers. The orange stickers were posted on the housing property for this issue today and zoning it um, issues from to get community input around that. But ironically enough, the church itself had no posting on it. And this is for the last seven days, and I've been going by that church site for, and so I can fully document that, and I will communicate that via email with the committee members via email. But if there is going to be community input around this issue, make sure that community is informed with the process and that it's fully transparent for those who do have some concerns around uh, this, this potential opportunity in the neighborhood to be an asset, potentially, that it's just done in a fully transparent way. And I think that's, that should be the standard of, of how the city of Minneapolis operates. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, oh for the record, your address, please. 4205 Oakland. Thank you. And no questions. Um, others uh, wishing to speak on this matter? Please come on up and give your name and address for the record. Thanks, Tom Pearson, 3225 Third Avenue South, about um, six blocks from the site. Um, I'd like to encourage you to approve this uh, with the 70 parking spaces that have been described. And um, I just wanna give you a reference to the store in the Seward neighborhood, which um, greatly exceeded their projected sales initially out of the gate. And so the parking is very cramped there because there was a lot more interest in that site than uh, they had anticipated. I was parking there earlier today. It's difficult to maneuver. I would not like to see that happen at this store. And if there is going to be a site at this, uh, a co-op at this location, I would want to see the capacity for that store to be uh, able to handle the amount of business that the retail outlet would be able to provide to the community. So in terms of parking, I really would encourage you to allow that, uh, that full 70 parking spaces. I think that this approval should happen without a contingency for community benefit agreement. I, I believe that community benefit agreements are uh, worthwhile mechanisms for you as a planning commission to consider when institutions are negotiating planning processes within communities, in particular because there is no way to affect the highest level of governance in many of the institutions that come to you with plans within these communities. The Seward Co-op does have uh, many pathways for participation and voice to be made real at the highest level of governance. And so a community benefit agreement could be something that occurs in parallel, but for that to be a focal point, a contingency of this approval would put too much emphasis on that mechanism. And that ultimately there needs to be 
two pathways for community participation in affecting this site. Community benefit agreement is legitimate, but also there needs to be a, not merely a transactional thought process with the sewer co-op in this neighborhood, there needs to be something that is transformational. And by that I mean the people in the community need to take ownership of that site and affect change within Seward Co-op, and that mechanism exists. It exists in fact, and it exists in philosophy with how that store is structured. Thanks. Thank you very much. No questions, okay. Anyone else wishing to speak, uh, please come on up and I don't see anyone else. In that case, I will close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, we have a lot of work in front of us here. Um, many recommendations from staff and counter arguments from the applicant and comments from the public. Uh, Commissioner Lipke Pier. I actually have a question for staff, and it's probably Jason, but um, I can't actually recall when we've uh, made, ever made a project contingent on agreement on a community benefits agreement. Is that something that is in the Planning Commission's purview, or where does that? I mean, is this a city council thing? Is it something we're allowed to do? I'm just, I don't know. Uh, commissioners, uh, it, it really is uh, outside the scope of the commission's authority, uh, particularly many of the things that uh, we heard people discussing as potentially being uh, incorporated into a community benefits agreement. Uh, we can certainly wish the community and the uh, steward good luck in arriving at uh, uh, that kind of agreement, uh, but those things are just outside the scope of, of the commission's uh, authority. Okay. Um, any other comments, uh, actions, motions? Uh, Commissioner Brown. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just had a quick yeah. uh, follow-up question for staff, too. Could you just talk about the notification process? Because I believe we do mailings as well as posted notifications. Mr. Wittenberg, could you just talk about what we've done in this case? Certainly. Um, Commissioner Bender, uh, we have uh, many channels of notification that go out. I wish I had the list in front of me. However, um, it does include uh, notice in a, in a newspaper. It includes uh, notice uh, to the Neighborhood Association. It includes notice to all property owners within 350 feet of, of all the sewered uh, properties in question. Um, uh, the orange posters are supposed to be posted uh, on, on the property. It sounds like perhaps there was a glitch with that. Uh, but there are multiple channels uh, that we uh, uh, pursue a public notification. Okay, uh, Commissioner Brown. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm going to start things off with a motion, and I will move approval of items A, B, and C, that is the two rezonings and the conditional use permit for a surface parking lot, uh, item C with uh, the one stated condition. Okay, moved A, B, and C. May I have a second? Do I have a second? Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on that? And I, I, I would just like to reiterate very quickly what Mr. Wittenberg had, had just said. I'm certainly very excited about the dis discussion surrounding a community benefits agreement, but again, it's something that really isn't within our uh, purview um, or our framework for for making a decision on these land use applications okay other comments on the motion for approving a B and C if not the uh, clerk please call the roll Bender Aye. Brown Aye. Forney Aye. Kisselman Kronzer Lipke Pierre Slack, that's seven zero. Okay, then we have, I think, seven variances. That's, that's right, and I will uh, start with variance F, and I will move uh, that we deny variance F. That is the variance for reducing the rear yard setback for the parking lot. Okay, I'll move to have second. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, that that's the the one that will be taken care of by some different configuration of the parking lot. Okay, let's call a roll on that one. Bender, Aye. Brown, Aye, Forney, Aye, Gisselman, Aye, Kronzer, Aye, Lipke Pier, Aye, Slack, Aye, 
Seven zero. Okay, uh, continuing on variances. And I will move approval of variances D, E, G, H, I, and J. And variance H has three stated conditions. Okay. Uh, we have a second on that one? Okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, please call a roll on those six variances. Bender? Aye. Brown? Aye. Forney? Aye. Kisselman? Aye. Kronzer? Aye. Lipke Pier? Aye. Slack? Aye. Seven zero. Okay, those are uh, approved. Uh, continuing? Item K, the site plan review, with the 15 stated conditions, and I would like to make a modif modification to condition number 10 related to the northwest corner of the building. I would like to reword that so that it reads that the elevator storage room at the corner of the building shall include transparent windows, uh, include artwork, and provide visibility into the store. Okay, so your your motion is a staff recommendation modifying condition 10, as you just stated. Okay, uh, let's have a second on that to get that on the floor. Okay, that's moved and seconded. Uh, now would be a time to modify any other conditions or add conditions if that was the interest of the commission. Commissioner Kronzer. I'd like to propose to remove condition number 9 and number 12 from the site plan review. Let's just do them one at a time. Number nine. Okay, uh, and your reasons? Um, so I was walking here on the street and as people walk, they walk parallel to the building face and they're actually looking towards the doors as you walk parallel to a building face. So with the canopy and with maybe some concrete treatments, I think that entrance will be fairly um, well identified. And, and I believe the applicant is true with the dimension of the north-south dimension of the inside of the store is really tight and accessible vestibules are enormous wastes of space, but we need to do them per the building code. So it would really dramatically disrupt the inside of the store. And I think the applicant has done a very good job coming up with compromises that we've asked for. So I think this is one where we can say, I think the entrance will work as the doors are situated. Okay, I, I would add that the canopy and the recess probably further accentuate that that's an entrance, so people won't be finding it hard to get there. Uh, we actually need a second on that. Okay, moved and seconded to strike condition nine. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, and uh, now 12. Yes, um, well, I completely agree with the intent of this um, condition. I don't think the sidewalk is going to be used as staff has sketched it out. Um, and also the concern with the parallel parking is, is really <clears throat> quite real as the applicant laid out with us. Having a one-way drive with people trying to parallel park and people trying to exit the parking lot, <clears throat> it's going to be a nightmare. So um, with the added green to the east side of the, of the lot, I think that's actually going to be a better benefit than trying to get a, a pedestrian space that's going to be very little used in that lot. So um, I think the trade-off is with um, denying that variance for the setback on the, the rear side. Okay, so that's the motion to strike condition 12. Is there a second? Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, we'll strike that. Uh, any other modifications to the site plan review conditions? If not, our main motion is to approve the site plan review with, now what are we down to, uh, 13 conditions and a modification on what has been numbered condition 10. Does that sound right? Okay. Um, wait, sorry. Yes. I have a question for staff. Uh, condition number 13, can you remind me where that setback yard, landscape yard is? Variance. Uh, so the modifications that they're showing this evening would comply with that requirement. So there would be no reason yeah, to eliminate so that, that condition of approval. Okay. Any other discussion on the main motion? Uh, if not, uh, clerk, please call the roll. 
Bender? Aye. Brown? Aye. Forney? Aye. Gisselman? Aye. Kronzer? Aye. Bipke Pier? Aye. Slack? Aye. Seven zero. Okay, uh, continuing, two more. And I would like to move approval of items L and M, the plat and the vacation. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on items L and M? Seeing none, uh, please call a roll on those two applications. Bender? Aye. Brown? Aye. Forney? Aye. Gisselman? Aye. Kronzer? Lipke Pier, Slack, seven zero. Okay, thank you very much. That completes business on that, and uh, we trust that the uh, Seward Co-op will continue working with the Bryant and Central neighborhoods uh, in the spirit of a community benefits agreement. And as was pointed out, your governance structure uh, allows for the community to get in and and modify the way the store operates in their neighborhood. So we look forward to that. Thank you very much. That concludes our business. Any announcements, uh, Mr. Wittenberg? Just a very robust uh, committee of the whole agenda this Thursday. Very robust. You're bringing in dinner for us? I'll bring something. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We are adjourned uh, until June 23rd.